You're listening to Whatever is Cool with Me, and we just heard I Won't Mention It Again by Donovan Woods from his new EP, Big Hurt Boy. And I'm joined now by Donovan Woods, who will be in town for two shows at the NAC on May 17th and 18th. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. I think it's, it's funny to me how people put the emphasis on the different words in Big Hurt Boy, and I, I wonder what it says about each phrase. You said Big Hurt Boy, which I think is a very interesting one. That's what I said? <laughs> I emphasize yeah. the hurt. Wow. You emphasize the hurt. Yeah, that's bad, maybe, right? Man. Well, <laughs> my, my daughter turned 12 yesterday, and she had five other 12-year-old girls sleeping over last night, so I'm, I'm hurting a little bit. So. Oh, that right? oh, that's yeah. fun. That's fun, right? That's wild. It's fun for them. Um, okay, so let's go back in time. You're 14 years old. You're super into music. What was the kick in the pants to pick up a guitar? Um, my sister, I have an older sister who's very cool. She's a year older than me. And she was very clear to me that I was going to need a special skill to, uh, uh, she could tell that I was straight and that uh, she's, she's, my sister's gay. And she was uh, having some knowledge of how to pick up girls in that regard. She could tell that I was going to need a special skill to be able to do that. And she said, you should learn how to play the guitar and sing because that will work. And that's, that's why I did it. 100 percent that's why is, is that where big hurt boy came from she heard yeah, it so long I, ago there are probably some there's probably some connection there yeah hey, you're very much a storyteller with your songs and it, it often leans on observations about people and their emotions or actions so for you what are the benefits and the challenges of writing songs this way i have you know like the I am sort of stuck in it in a way that uh, I can't really explain. I just love that stuff. I love the language of interpersonal relationships. I love the way what people decide to tell each other. I love passive aggressive t talk. I love, you know. Um, and when I write about that stuff, words just appear in my head, you know, and I try to write about other things. And I can do it. It's just not as easy. The thing I really want to do is talk about people who are hurting each other and without maybe knowing it or trying to figure out why they have hurt somebody or why they've been hurt by something, you know. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I don't, I don't really know. And I try to not really think about why or what that means about me. I don't think I'm a particularly hurt person. Like, I'm not, I'm mostly in a good mood. I don't think there's really much wrong with me i mean there's the normal things wrong i mean there's tons yeah. of shit wrong with me. There's, yeah. there's, there's, there's the normal things wrong with you got me. the right amount yeah i think a good amount like an okay amount a manageable yeah. amount so i don't think i'm like uh you know endeavoring to work out my own trauma or something like that i just I, for some reason i enjoy writing about it so i just i end up chasing it all the time so in keeping with that theme of observation and creation it got me thinking about Jerry Seinfeld and his trademark observational humor, you know, like what's the deal yeah. with. So, and I bring this up because as you mentioned, you're a guy who often sings sad songs, but you're hilarious. So your between song banter is better than most comedy sets. And, and I don't say that lightly. And so I'm <laughs> curious, how, how much did you have to work at that for it to be so natural and so funny? I wonder if it's actually. I mean, thank you for. I appreciate that. For first of all, I, but I I do wonder if it's only if the, a lot of the funniness comes from the idea that I'm supposed to be doing something else, which is singing songs. I think there's some sort of like, I think I get a free pass in some regard because I should be doing something else that I'm instead. I seemingly am focusing on the jokes in between the songs rather than like the songs seem like a chore to me when I'm up there. I'd rather just talk. You know, I think so. I think I earn. I don't know. If I was really a stand-up comedian, whether it would be really funny. But anyway, that's it. I do, that's always been very easy for me. I don't know what uh, I have. I've, I've like I've enjoyed public speaking since I was a kid. I like yeah. everyone. We were doing speeches. I was like, oh great, this finally I'll be able to do something. <laughs> I'll be yeah. able to talk. I, I just there's something wrong with my brain, and, I, and it's funny. My daughter has the same thing. I watched her. Um, you know, anytime she's giving a presentation, I just watch her like. 
she just locks in and can do it. She's not nervous. She's my son is the same way. They both they both have that gene. They're just not nervous about it. So I don't know what it is. I just feel lucky. My dad yeah. is a good public speaker. I don't know. It is a good life skill. I, I'm that same way. No surprise. I I do radio, but my daughter's yeah. not. You know, she didn't get that uh, that gene from me. But oh, well, it's, maybe it's, she will still though. But but don't, isn't it a thrill to be like to think like I can I'm going to be able to get up and speak at these at funerals. I'm going to be able to get up there and do it because yeah. it's nice. To have someone who can do it in the family, God, that's nice. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it helps, you know. It's a skill. Yeah. <laughs> it's my Napoleon oh, Dynamite yeah. skill, so. Yeah. So the, the that whole idea of the, the, the sad songs, the funny in between, it actually makes for really interesting live experience and like i loved it so much i've actually brought my parents to shows afterwards because i said you're gonna love this right because the, you know they can both appreciate the music they love music um but yeah and just walking away knowing that they enjoyed the music but also laughed a lot and i don't know it for people who haven't seen you perform i would highly encourage they check out one or both of your ottawa shows so um yeah you, I, did your parents like it did they enjoy it did they like the show they loved it oh yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm just interested in the person who has no clue who I am and watches it. I'm interested in their opinion more than I am of anybody. So that's always interesting. Well, I mean, you know, they listen to my show and I've, I've played you for oh, years, so they're familiar to a degree. But, you know, um, just to see it in person, it's very different. So um, yeah. and, and speaking of seeing you perform and, and, and the, sort of those two sides, it reminds me of how I felt the first time I saw Jan Arden because I was used to her sad songs. And when I saw her perform the first time, I'm like, she's hilarious. Like I, I really like her. And anyway, yeah. uh, but comedian wise, do you have a favorite comedian? Oh man. I, oh man. I mean, I love, I really love Jerry. I've always loved Jerry Seinfeld. Right now I'm really into this guy, Nate Bargetzi, who's like a, he's from Nashville and he's so funny to me. Good God. Um, but you know, I, I like, I mean, John Mulaney, like everybody, we're all in love with John Mulaney right now, but he's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go see him in September, actually. Oh, sweet. Yeah. He's coming around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I love comedians. I love, you know, I have a friend who's a comedian and Mae Martin is her name. And she's sort of, we have sort of grew up together in university. And I think she's just incredible. Like everybody who's sees her will just love her that skill of being just like a microphone and being able to take somebody through to an hour of entertainment with just a microphone is like yeah what a what amazing ability yeah she was on that uh, uh amazon prime show last comic laughing wasn't it uh, with all those canadian yeah. comedians yeah. and stuff yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah we amazon really liked her so yeah, we were rooting for Tom Green, home, hometown boy but yeah yeah who knew that tom green was like that that show was like really demonstrated that Tom Green is really funny. Like, yeah. there's some, you know, we wonder whether his comedy would be left in the annals of sort of like, it was very funny in 1997 because, it, God, it was so funny in 1998. And I, you know, like, but he's just very, still very right. funny. It was interesting. He's genuinely weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you've, uh, you've been really quite successful in writing songs for others. And I'm curious, do you write songs and pitch them to artists that you think could pull it off? Or do they come and ask you to write? Or is it a label that approaches you and says, hey, I want you to write for this artist? A little bit of all of that. Like sometimes that ha all those things sort of happen. It, however it happens, it happens. You know, it's uh, it's it's never... I mean, so, so sometimes I'll have a song that I ha have and I don't quite think I want to do it, or I think someone else could do it better than me and I'll send it to, you know, and I have artist friends who I know that they're looking for, what well, in the industry they're called outside songs, songs that they didn't write. So when I know someone is looking for outside songs or will cut something, I'll send them to that artist and see if they want to do it. And uh, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And other times people will ask if you have anything, if they're looking for a song off the record and sometimes a label will ask you to write with a new artist. But it's funny, it's like all, it's all, it all seems so different, but it's really all the same thing. I mean, the songs that I want are, to keep for me are the songs that other people want. There's no, <laughs> like, no secret recipe. It's the it's good ones, like, yeah. It's good ones and bad ones. That's yeah. like the, it's the truth. And, and so many people ask me, they go, oh, I got a lot of songs that I don't want to use. Should I pitch them to other artists? And it's like, <laughs> well, if, if you don't like them, they, nobody will like them. That's the sort of truth, yeah. you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, Tim McGraw, uh, he released a version of your song, Portland, Maine. Um, your version's better, by the way. But uh, how did you connect with him? 
Well, Tim, we Tim. Uh, oh, that's like one of those Nashville stories where it's like we wrote that song, and I, I didn't. I I thought at the time I was like, well, that's the best song I've ever written. I I, I thought it was really great the day we wrote. My friend Abe and I wrote it together. It was the day he and I had met for the first time we wrote that. And I remember being at the wow. airport and going like, God, I love this song. So I didn't really care what happened. I wasn't thinking about it. And we sent it to someone at Abe's publisher. And um, there was a woman by the name of Laura Wright. And she, uh, her older sister, babysat for Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. And she took over a CD to Tim McGraw. Her dad is a famous music producer. His name is Mark Wright. Um, and so she took him a CD of the song and gave it to him. It's a good story. I mean, it's, it is, and it is, it's like, it's, I mean, it sounds so strange, but it's, that's the type of thing in Nashville that occurs all the time, you know? It's, it's like a Hallmark it's, movie. <laughs> it's not, not a very big city. For the amount of famous it is, it really is not a very big city. It's smaller than Hamilton. I've never been, so it's on the list. Yeah. So oh, you know, Tim McGraw's actually been nailing the cowboy roles in movies and TV. Have you uh, have you tried getting a cameo as his cowboy sidekick? Or no, I, I I've only hung out I hung out with him one time, and uh, I mean he's like one of those guys who's like a force of nature. I couldn't do anything. Could. <laughs> I have heard a story about people being on tour with him. They were opening for him this band, and they were so nervous about seeing him in the morning because he would make them work out and do an ice bath in a garbage can. So oh, they wow. would like sneak off the bus and, and like be freaked out if he would see him. Because if he saw them, he'd be like, "Get over here and flip this tire." <laughs> Tim McGraw's into CrossFit. Who knew? Yeah. Oh man, it's so fit. Yeah. All right. So let's have a listen right now to a, one of well, my favorite song of yours. It's uh, called "Between Cities." Since we left her street 
And that was Between Cities by Donovan Woods. And we're chatting because he's going to be in town on May 17th and 18th. Now, you write a mighty fine sad song, and a lot of artists say that doing so is cathartic. So is it like that for you, or do you maybe have a song that you don't perform live because it just makes you feel terrible? It brings up all those emotions. No, the, one, the ones that make me feel terrible, I like to do them because I think it is good. Um, but I, but there are ones that I don't think... I think the thing that makes me sort of not play them is when I don't think they really did the thing I was trying to do. I don't think they were successful at doing communicating the thing I was trying to communicate. Like that Between Cities one is like, really was just somebody had told me that they, someone that I was uh, dating, had told me that they really liked driving. They really liked me. I mean, we were going to break up and they said that they really enjoyed driving with me because they felt safe and they could go to sleep. And I thought, well, isn't that nice that like the time they like me the most is when they're asleep. <laughs> and uh, and then I think that feeling is kind of in there, that sort of weird feeling, that weary feeling is in that song. You know, Sometimes you don't capture it. And when I don't capture it, Sometimes the song still has value, but I, I don't, I, I, I tend to not love it forever, you know? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's why you write new songs, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you did something not long ago called the With People Project, and I really liked this. Can, can you explain what it was? Yeah, so we put out the, my album, uh, which was called Without People, that was uh, in, put it out sort of squarely in the middle of the pandemic in November of 2020. And, um, so we had all these marketing budget for posters and stuff, but nobody was outside. So there was no point in putting up billboards or <laughs> posters or whatever, because nobody would see them. So we instead decided to just hire an artist, a whole bunch of artists that we had like found, or we sourced a few, but people that we had already seen on Instagram or liked their work or knew, and asked them to make a, a piece for each of the songs on the record. So there's like dance pieces and there's paintings and there's uh, people who wrote a poem. You know, there's like, a whole bunch of different ways. So we then we got to watch those artists sort of, uh, you know, we got to pay them a good amount, which was a great time to give an artist some money because nobody was getting any work. For sure. And uh, it was a great way to use the, the marketing money. I mean, that's stuff you can do when you have your own label. And then uh, we got these wonderful pieces that sort of were a way to highlight each song on the record because it's, it's hard to get everyone to listen to a full record these days, you know, I don't, I don't even do it. So to that I would expect other people to do it is, is, uh, you know, it's problematic, but I, I think it was a good way to highlight each song, you know, in a, in a fun way. Absolutely. I, I love that idea of using the marketing budget in a, in a different way. I, you know, I interviewed uh, Jacques Roy, uh, if you're familiar with him and what he would do is the money that he would get to make a video they would take a camera and they would use that money to go travel because he just he loves to travel and then they would film while they were traveling wherever it was so you know one time it was india and they and then they'd film it and edit it together and make a, a video like that I'm like man what a great way to use that marketing uh, marketing money Wait, that's a nice idea yeah good idea um now do royalty checks for you get noticeably bigger every year around gray cup time <laughs> no not anymore no, <laughs> they, I, <laughs> I say that for people who don't know, because you have a song called My Cousin Has a Grey Cup Ring. Um, what's the story there? Does he have a Grey Cup Ring? Yeah, my dad, my dad's cousin won the Grey Cup. Um, his name is Glenn Weir. And he would always talk about, you know, when it was around Grey Cup time, he'd say, you know, my cousin won the Grey Cup. It was just sort of a brag that my dad had, you know. And I sort of thought, oh, that would make a great little folk song. And I think Glenn eventually heard it. I don't think he liked it. He thought he couldn't. I think he no. couldn't really figure out why the hell he was involved there. <laughs> and I don't think he was thrilled about it. But yeah, so and it got played on some. I mean, I think it still gets played on the CBC around then. But it, it got featured on the, on the Grey Cup broadcast at one time. Uh, oh yeah, which I think I accepted like seventy five dollars for the fee for that song. I don't remember what it was. I, I had no idea. I just took whatever they offered. <laughs> well, if your dad's cousin doesn't like it, he can pull a Patrick Waugh and use his Grey Cup ring and plug it in his ears. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what he can. Yeah. Oh, yeah, plugging. I cannot hear. They have my two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like so obvious someone made it up for him. 
Uh, and then he did I don't know. That, he's he's a different cat. Like, so. Stanley Cup rings, plugging my ears. Plugging my ears, no. yeah. Him and Jeremy Roenick, Hi. yeah. <laughs> What's the craziest or funniest thing that's ever happened to you while on tour? Oh, you know, like, I... I um... One time really early on, I was talking about this the other day. I mean, not I, I'm pretty low key. I don't really get into crazy hijinks. I have, you know, and I didn't really get put on the radio until I was like 30. So I was already done all the fun things that I could do. <laughs> but the um, one time after the show in Kelowna, this guy came up to me and he was very drunk. It's like this big guy. And he goes, I own all, all Tim Hortons franchises around here, and I want to give you something. I was like, okay. And then he goes, come to my truck. And I went to his truck. Oh, God. And then he gave me five Tim Hortons gift cards that he said each had uh, $1,500 on them. So it was, what does that add up to? $7,500? Don't do math on this show. No. It's seventy five hundred of of Tim Hortons money. And so he was like, I want to fund all your money for your tour. And so I was like, <laughs> Okay. And I left, we went to bed and I was like, This it can't be true. So we went to I was on tour with my tour manager Eric and Joey Landreth, uh, from the Brothers Landreth, just the three of us in a van. We went to the Tim Hortons the next day, we all got chili. We gave the woman the card, and she's like, "Do you want your balance?" I was like, "Yeah." And she goes, "One thousand four hundred. Like, so, <laughs> you're kidding? So they, they really were. They really wow. were. Wow. Have you burned through them all yet? We used it on that tour, and then I gave the rest. Of, I gave them away to people. I have a well, you know, I won't get into my family. I have a cousin who lives on the streets. I gave one to him. I gave uh, some to some other people that we met along the way that were on the uh, living on the streets. So, because I mean, one of them, hopefully they were able to hold on to it, but I can't eat ten thousand dollars worth of no. chili. I'd be dead. You're, you're a good man, Charlie Brown. Yeah, yes, that's right. So, who is an artist? I, mean, I, kept, one. I kept one. That's pretty. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's fifteen hundred dollars of uh, yeah, that's of curlers. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a cool story. I, I can't believe it. So. Um, <laughs> Okay, so who is an artist or a band that you think more people should know about right now? Oh man, um, I'm, I mean, more people are knowing about him like every day is our Canadian guy Lee Folabek, who I just like, I'm in awe of his work right now. Just everything he puts out thrills me. I think he's so good, mm -hmm. and people are sort of cluing in. It seems like his shows seem to be getting bigger and bigger from what I see on the internet and. Um, I think it's he's so worth it, worthy of it. He's so good. Oh yeah. And then there's, a, there's a, an American guy that I love, whose name is Henry Jameson, mm -hmm. who uh, had a big song on Spotify called "Real Peach." It's a really nice song, but it's also just like it's just a writer, you know, like a writer of the highest order, a really really good songwriter. Um, that I feel like every time I, he releases something new, I learn a lot from it and I'm inspired by it. Yeah, I play both of those artists quite a bit on the show. And actually, so Henry Jameson, his song Gloria, there's a line in there that makes me feel so nostalgic. It just immediately hits me when they're in the arcade watching the progress of their three letter names. And I went yeah, to arcades yeah. all the time as a, as a kid, like I'm mid 40s now. Yeah. And I just remember, you know, you, A, 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 and then you change it to, you know, your initials and stuff. and immediately just hit with a wave of nostalgia and i love that song so then he so then that that's the reason i got to know that guy because that song is it's like me and my cousin went walking when and he's got a traditional melody from a song called arthur mcbride okay which is a song and it's it goes me and my cousin Juan arthur mcbride as we went to walking down by the seaside it's a traditional song okay and i was like and it's a i didn't you know i mean people know about that from the East Coast, it's, I mean, it's, it's, there's a cover of that song by Paul. I mean, cover. It's a traditional song. No one knows who wrote it. But there's Paul Brady and Andy. Oh, I can't remember the other guy's name. But it, the, that version of that song, uh, Arthur McBride, is unbelievable. So I, as soon as I heard that song, I was like, oh, he's referencing Arthur McBride. I sent him a message. I was like, are you <laughs> referencing the original song of Arthur McBride? He's like, yeah. And then so we got to talking at that point. So now we get to chat with each other sometimes. But but yeah, I love that song too. There's so many little things, so many little details in his writing. Yeah, 
Yeah, very good yeah. songwriter, big fan. And last time I saw Lee Foldback was in a church. So imagine him playing this big piano in a church with the acoustics. It was amazing. So yeah, he's incredible. Yeah. He's so okay. cool. So you're you're playing two shows at the NAC. Uh, tell us yeah. about them and what's different between the two. Well, the first one is solo. It's just me, which is fun. I play a bunch of new stuff and there's sort of no limit to how much I can talk at that. <laughs> just, the only limit to the, the talking of the band show is that I can feel the band like staring holes in the back of my head. <laughs> can, we, can we play the song, please? So um, the the solo one is the first night, which is the 20th, I think. Is that right? The 20th. Uh, um, no, it's the 17th and then 18th of May. <laughs> Got that out. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the 17th is the first one and it's the solo one. And uh, yeah, I mean, it will be the same length as set, but it'll just be me up there. And then the band one is the next night. And the band show is, you know, a big show with lights and things now. It's a pretty big, pretty big production. So the dancers and stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, lots of stuff like that. People, trapeze artists, people from the uh, the Cirque du Soleil show, uh, Tumbaku, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I do a game with my friends where we try to make up fake uh, Cirque du Soleil names, and it's really funny because the hey, names that they give those things, God, they're so stupid. If I don't get them, but well, when Grimes performed at the Players Music Gala years ago, she had a, a pole dancer, a male pole dancer, come named Gary. It was oh. great. So, you know, something Gary to is his name. I think it was Gary. Yeah, yeah, he was good. Great name, bro. Yeah. All right. So we're going to end with maybe one more song from you. How about you pick a song by you uh, that I can play? Your choice. Oh, that's hard. Um, well, the one that I, the most, what about Iowa? The one that I did with Efo Donovan. Would you play that one? Absolutely. That one? Absolutely. That's what we'll end with, I Iowa. Today's the one year anniversary of that song coming out too, so it's oh, uh, it's great. excellent, perfect. Yeah. Listen, it, it, I've been trying to get you on the show for uh, years, so it's really a pleasure to chat with you. And you know, right. good luck why, on- why was it why was it not happening? I feel like I would have done it whenever you wanted. I've I've seen that you you know you I'm on your playlist all the time. I always appreciate it, and I always think when I look at your playlist, I think okay, this this is a good show. This is a reasonable show. Good taste, face for radio. I get it a lot. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. No, you just always can't make it work with the schedule. So I, traditionally, I only ever did interviews live. Um, you know, I've just got a life. But now that I'm had to record from home, I figured out how to use the nice mic and Zoom, and I'm proficient enough that I can pre-record yeah. now. So open up a whole new world here, right? <laughs> well, anytime, man. I'd love to. I, I appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate this. So thanks so much, and uh, and good luck with the rest of the tour and your shows in Ottawa. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, man. All right. Take care. Here's Iowa.